The Matter of Arata, read in four parts by St. Clair. Part 1. Enmer the Hunter and the Lord of Arata. This is the tale of the city of Arata and of its great rival, the city of Uruk. Majestic bull-bearing vigor and great awesome splendor, breast in the storm where destinies are determined. Uruk, wherein lies the Ayana temple, where the god Anu lives and takes his daily meals. In the days of yore, the great princes allowed the Ayana temple to lift its head high. Rain increased in the lands of Uruk, bringing forth dappled barley aplenty and carp floods. Ayana was therefore already well founded before the temples of the foreigners, before the lands of Dilmun existed, before the lands of the Martu people existed, and before the lands of Arata existed, the temple of Ayana was already well founded, and the holy house of Inanna was brick built, and the people of Uruk were already bathing for Inanna's festivals. Time passed. Then the temples of the other lands were built, the lands of Dilmun, the lands of the Martu people, and the lands of Arata with their commercial practices, their riches of gold, silver, copper, tin, blocks of lapis lazuli, and mountain stones brought down from the mountains. All these things the lords of Arata adorned their temple with, which they dedicated to Inanna, and its interior was colorfully adorned with flawless lapis lazuli, and shone forth like silver in the load. But the lords of Arata did not please Inanna like the lords of Uruk. For the lords of Uruk had built the Ayana temple for Inanna, whereas the lords of Arata had built their temple simply to appease their own arrogance. It was at that time that Inanna chose a lord in her holy heart to be the lord of Uruk, Enmer the hunter, who was a living son of the god Utu. Inanna gave these words to Enmer, Arata has built a temple in arrogance, and its existence is displeasing to me. Therefore, the materials adorning the temple shall be thrown down, the gold and silver, the tin and the copper, and the blocks of lapis lazuli, and the mountain stones that were brought down from the mountains. They shall all be stripped from the temple of Arata, and taken to a rich the Ayana temple at Uruk. Let Arata submit beneath the yoke of Uruk on my behalf. Let the work that the builders of Arata have done be undone for me, and let the interior of the Ayana temple be colorfully adorned with that flawless lapis lazuli to brighten my spirit within Uruk, causing it to shine forth like silver in the load. May the people marvel admiringly, and may Utu witness the act in joy. Upon hearing Inanna's words, Enmer asked her for counsel as to how a city like Arata should be caused to submit. And Inanna said these words to him, I shall offer you this advice, and you shall heed it. Choose a messenger from the troops, one who is both eloquent of speech and endowed with endurance. Let him travel over the mountains with my holy procession. Let the mountain chieftains humbly salute me like tiny mice, and let the teeming multitudes grovel in the dust for me. Let this messenger travel to the Lord of Arata and give him my command. Strip down the adornments of the temple that he has adorned in arrogance, and arrange for the materials to be transported to Uruk. Lest I make the people of Arata fly off from the city like wild doves from the tree. Lest I make them flee like frightened beasts from a well-founded home which has been set ablaze. Lest I requite them as if at the current market rate. Lest I make Arata gather dust like the city of Eridu. Lest I curse the inhabitants of the land like those coastal peoples which Enki had caused to be cursed and utterly devoured by the sea. Enmer did as Inanna had counseled, and found a messenger from his troops who was both eloquent of speech and endowed with endurance, Lugal Banda by name. And after Enmer had given him Inanna's instructions, he added these words of his own. On that day, when there is no snake to plague us, when there is no scorpion, when there is no hyena, when there is no lion, when there is neither wild dog nor wolf, and when there is thus neither fear nor trembling, mankind shall have no rival. At such a time may the lands of Hamazi, and the Subartu peoples, and the Martu peoples, and the Akkadians who possess all that befits them, and the Sumerians resting in security, May they all once again address the gods in a single language, as they did in the days of yore, 
For at that time the god Enki, wise and knowing overseer of mankind, the lord of abundance and of steadfast decision-making skills, expert of the gods who was chosen for his wisdom, saw the ambitious chieftains of men, and their ambitious princes, and their ambitious kings, and their behavior was most displeasing to him. Therefore he began to cause small changes in their speech, until it was as though they had many different speeches instead of one, and could no longer understand one another. Let Arata, and all the peoples of the world, therefore submit to the will of Inanna. May the speech of Aruk and Arata unite, and may we address the gods once more in the same language. Lugalbanda then gave heed to the words of his emperor, the king of Aruk. He journeyed by day with Utu in the heavens, and by night under the light of Nana, whom the Akkadians call Sin. He traveled across the mountains, and the mountain chieftains saluted Inanna like tiny mice, and the teeming multitudes groveled in the dust for her. He made known the authority of his emperor, and spoke openly the words that Inanna had put into his heart. Our father, my master, Enmer the hunter, the Lord of Aruk has sent me to you, and he has spoken thusly. But the Lord of Arata interrupted him, saying, What does it matter to me what your father has spoken? What is it to me what your master has said? But Lugalbanda continued, This is what he has said. Lugalbanda then recited the words that had been given to him by Inanna, and those by Enmer, and then he added these words of his own. Say whatever you will to me in response, O Lord of Arata, and I shall return with the response to the house of my lord. I shall announce the response within the Ayana shrine of Uruk. The lord of Arata sat upon his golden throne, listening to the eloquent words of this foreign soldier which had come into his presence, and he replied thusly to him, Bring this message back to your master. It is I whom Inanna, queen of heaven and earth, has blessed to become the lord of Arata, I for whose sake she barred the passes through the mountains as if with great gates. Now then, how shall Arata be made to submit to Uruk? The very idea is absurd. It's out of the question. But Lugalbanda replied, It is for your arrogance, O lord of Arata, that Inanna has stripped you of the honor she once gave you. She has given it to Enmer the hunter, the lord of Uruk, who is her humble servant. And she now dwells there in the Ayana temple of Uruk. At this, the Lord of Arata became distressed and deeply troubled. He stared at his own feet, trying to find an answer. And when one came to him, he bellowed it, Messenger, speak to your master, the Lord of Aruk, and tell him that this mountain range protects us like a great tree of life. Its roots form a net, its branches a snare, and its rocks cut like talons through the flesh of men. The natural barriers that Inanna has built for us are impenetrable. Armies have tried before and failed. Their men were defeated by thirst, by hunger, by illness, and by injury. We captured their survivors, and their blood ran red down Mount Ararat. That mountain is like a consummate warrior from whose face blood drips. It shines like Utu and Nana, majestic in the high heavens. So tell these things to the Lord of Uruk. Your master cannot hope to mobilize an army successfully across those mountains. And even if they do, we'll be fully prepared for a contest, and we shall not be wearied by travel. Instead, give him my command. Bid him to collect all of the barley grain in Uruk. Let Inanna, whom your king claims to honor, be impressed by the luxuriance of the grain pile. Bundle the grain with great nets loaded onto your asses, and have them driven to Arata to be given as an offering to Inanna, under whose security we rest. Do this, and then I shall know for certain that Inanna prefers the hunter, and I, in my smallness, shall submit to him. After the Lord of Arata had finished speaking, Lugalbanda took leave of him and went on his way. He traveled back over the mountains with Inanna's holy procession, and appeared before the emperor within the Ayana temple. Lugalbanda recited to his lord all that had occurred on the journey, and Enmer wondered if the Lord of Arata had understood the implications of his own stratagem. Enmer then entered the royal granaries and storehouses of Uruk and ordered a great amount of barley grain to be removed and placed into nets, with the gaps in the nets closed with stalks of barley that had just begun to sprout. These he ordered to be loaded onto asses and driven to Arata, with Lugalbanda leading them, 
and he gave Lugalbanda these instructions. Return now to Arata, but do not bring the barley to the lord of Arata. Instead, distribute it amongst the peoples of Arata, the farmers living in the countryside around the city. Great famine has stricken their lands, and they will be grateful for aid. Tell the lord of Arata that the base of my scepter is the divine power of magnificence. Its crown provides a protective shade over Uruk. Under its branches, holy Inanna refreshes herself within the Ayana temple. Tell the lord of Arata to snap off a splinter for himself, to hold in his hand for the rest of his days. Lugalbanda crossed the mountains with his train of asses, and distributed the barley grain amongst the peoples who lived outside Arata, many of whom agreed that Arata should submit to Uruk. Lugalbanda then entered the city walls, and entreated the lord of Arata once again to submit to the will of Inanna. His courtiers wrung their hands in anxiety and despair, and some of them were already beginning to hail Enmer as the conqueror of Arata. Lugalbanda grew confident, and again repeated the words given to him on his first journey, along with the new ones provided to him by the Lord of Aruk. The Lord of Arata meditated for a day in his temple before he found an answer to give to Lugalbanda. Return now to your king, and give him this final challenge to prove his supremacy over Arata and Inanna's divine favor. Have him fashion a scepter made of no known substance, and have the scepter brought here before the court of Arata, wielded by a warrior wearing garments of no known color. Lugalbanda then returned to Uruk once more, and spoke to Enmer the words that the lord of Arata had given him. Enmer responded by giving Lugalbanda an extensive set of instructions which Lugalbanda knew he would not be able to remember and reproduce. So Enmer ordered a clay tablet to be manufactured in the speech of Arata, with his decrees and orders to be written upon it using a reed stylus to press into the clay. The messages were carved and the clay baked hard. The emperor gave the tablet to Lugalbanda and bade him return to Arata wielding the scepter of no known substance and wielding a garment of no known color, both of which had been fashioned by the king's order. In the days that followed this, after Lugalbanda had departed once more for Arata, Enmer acted as high priest during a ritual, in which a golden idol of Utu was carried to his holy altar within the Ayana temple, and great bronze vessels full of gold were placed alongside the altar. A sacrifice was then called for to be offered up to Utu. For the sacrifice, an elderly woman of Uruk was chosen to marry the emperor, and he bedded her for six nights. On the seventh night, she was brought to the Ayana temple, where they slaughtered sheep and goats, asses and cattle, and finally they let her blood run red down the altar of Utu, which the sun god found pleasing. Meanwhile, Arata celebrated a larger-than-average harvest season for their barley, largely due to the aid they had received from the lord of Uruk. But this was lost upon the lord of Arata, who felt more confident than ever that Inanna and her son Ishkur favored him. Lugalbanda traveled across the mountains once more and presented the scepter to the lord of Arata, wearing the garment which had been made for the purpose. The clay tablet was read out before the court, and the lord of Arata was angered to learn that Enmer had increased his demands for tribute far beyond the original asking price. Listen to me, O messenger. Inanna, lady of all the lands, has not abandoned Arata to be conquered by a foreign nation, since she has caused barley to flourish greatly in the land. The people of Arata are elevated, separated from other people. Blessed by Damuzid, who first allowed us to lift our head high and step forth over other lands, to firmly establish the rule of Inanna. If Enmer wishes to subdue this land, let his messenger duel my finest champion. Then perhaps Inanna's will shall truly be known. Lugalbanda then prepared for battle against the champion of Arata, who came out adorned just like Damuzid of old had been adorned, with his body wrapped in a garment of lion skins, and his head covered with a colorful turban. Both warriors were armed with spear and shield. They contested with one another, and Lugalbanda was victorious, slaying the champion of Arata. The Lord of Arata coldly accepted the authority of Uruk, and the people of Arata were forced to set about their task of providing the tribute which Enmer had commanded them to give, plying gold and silver, tin and copper, and blocks of lapis lazuli, and mountain stones that were brought down from the mountains. These they loaded onto asses and paraded through the city of Uruk, 
with Enmer and Lugalbanda at the head of the parade. The materials were used to adorn the Ayana temple, utilizing the greatest builders and artists of Uruk and Arata, so that the temple shone forth like silver in the load. But this was not the end of the conflicts between Enmer the Hunter and the Lord of Arata. Part 2 Enmer the Hunter and Insugirana Brickwork rising out from the shining plain, Uruk, city which reaches down from heaven to earth. Built in magnificence, standing strong in day or night. The glory of Uruk reaches wide and far, as far as the highlands of Arata, covering it like a garment of flax linen. The lord of Arata was called Insugirana, and his royal vizier was called Ansagaria. The lord of Uruk was called Enmer the Hunter, and his vizier was named Naminatuma. In the preceding days, Arata had been made to submit to Uruk by the will of Inanna and Enmer, and by the swiftness and endurance of his messenger Lugalbanda. The messenger soldier ran like a wild ram and fought like a falcon, until Ensugirana, in his smallness, submitted to Inanna's will. But Ensugirana was proud and arrogant, and believed himself to be a man born to be a god. It wasn't long before he began making rebellious noises against the Lord of Uruk. Let Enmer submit to me and bear my yoke, and let him see that the goddess Inanna in truth lies with me in the temple of Arata on a splendidly adorned bed. Truly, I dream with her and converse with her in all my waking moments. When Enmer heard word of Ensugirana's intentions, he ordered Nemanatama to have a clay tablet manufactured with decrees and orders to Arata written upon it using a reed stylus. The messages were written and the clay was baked hard. He gave the tablet to Lugalbanda and bade him return to Arata. Lugalbanda traversed the mountains along with an armed escort and came to Arata, entering the court of the city's lords, and he presented the carved document to Ensugirana. True it may be that the lord of Arata believes that he dwells with Inanna in his temple, reduced as it is. True also it may be that he believes that he lies with her in slumber, and speaks with her in all his waking moments. But it has been more than proven that the Queen Mother Inanna has chosen the Lord of Uruk, Enmer the Hunter, living son of Utu, as her earthly representative. For no city in the history of mankind has become as wealthy and as well adorned as Uruk, since she has decided to bless the city. And Sugirana, however, may have reason to believe himself forsaken by Inanna, for his great temple has been stripped of all those good things which it had been adorned with. And since then his privy member has been cursed, it produces forth no semen, and he turns his envy towards Enmer, because Enmer is capable of pleasing Inanna, both in body and in soul. And Sugirana fell silent at this. He certainly never expected a royal missive to be so vulgar and convened an assembly consisting of his high priests and his ministers of the realm to search for an answer to the message of Naminatama. The vizier of Arata, Ansagaria, spoke most confidently in the assembly. It was you, my lord, who made arrogant ravings against Enmer both before and after submitting to him. Ease yourself, or your heart will prompt you to achieve nothing. But Insugirana responded with steadfast contention, I will never submit to the lord of Uruk, even lest Arata become a ruined mound. Then a man came into the meeting room, Urjanurna by name, a sorcerer from the city of Hamazi, which had been defeated and conquered by Enmer the hunter. Urjanurna escaped the destruction of the city's government, and now wished to find a new court in which to practice his magic. He spoke to the assembly thusly, My lords, I believe it is within my powers to solve this problem. I shall make a rook and all other cities of the world submit to Arata. The world shall be made to give all they produce to the lord of Arata, by foot, by pack animal, by cart, and by boat. These words made Ensugirana very happy, and Ansagaria conceded the argument. The Lord of Arata and Sugirana offered the sorcerer Urjanurna 300 shekels of gold and 300 shekels of silver, and promised him the finest food and drink that the court of Arata had to offer, on the condition that this sorcerer would make all these things come true. 
The sorcerer directed his steps from the city of Arata towards the lands of the Sumerians. He came down upon Uruk's flocks and herds, causing great plagues to fall upon the city's stock of cattle, sheep, and goats. The udders of the mothers all dried up, and they produced neither milk nor butter nor cream. Many young calves and lambs and kids cried out and died for lack of milk, and there was great anxiety amongst the drovers and herders. They came into the city of Uruk and entered the Ayana temple, appealing to Utu for help. These pleas were heard by the god who sent word to Enmer. The lord of Uruk bade Naminatama to find a sorcerer of Uruk whose talent was greater than that of Urjanurna's. Naminatama sent messengers throughout the city and the countryside, looking for somebody who knew magic, and before long a local witch appeared to Enmer within the Ayana temple, naming herself Sajburu. She promised Enmer that she had the power to negate all of Virgin Erna's magic, which he had cast upon the herds, and furthermore that she could defeat the sorcerer in a duel of magic. Enmer the hunter, lord of Uruk, ruler of the city whose destiny was decreed by Anu and Enlil, placed his trust in the witch that had come into his presence, and promised Sajburu a reward even greater than that which had been promised to Urja Nurna. Sajburu made her way to the place where Urja Nurna practiced his wicked magic. She challenged him to a contest of magic with the punishment of death for the loser, and he consented to it. They chose a place at the banks of the Euphrates River, and they each took out a large handful of roe. Urjanurna cast his row back into the river, and it grew into a full-grown adult carp before their eyes. But then Sajburu cast her row back into the river, and it grew into a full-grown adult eagle, which grabbed the carp as it leaped out of the water and flew away with it. The sorcerer quickly took out another handful of row from the river and cast it back. It grew into a small female lamb, which began swimming as soon as it was born. Then Sajburu took out another handful of roe from the river and cast it back, and it grew into a full-grown adult male wolf, which began swimming as soon as it was born. And the wolf grabbed the lamb by its jaws and killed it, taking its body to the opposite riverbank and making away with it. After this happened, Sajburu said to Urjanurna, True it may be that you have magical powers, but you lack sense. How on earth could you think of doing sorcery against the city of Uruk? And Urjanurna answered her, Because I did not know that such a wise woman skilled in sorcery existed in Uruk. I acknowledge your superiority. Please do not be bitter. She reminded him that the loser of the contest would suffer death, terms that were agreed to by both parties involved. And he began pleading and praying to her, Please, sister, set me free. Let me return in peace to Arata. I swear I will make it known throughout the land how great you are. But Sajburu answered him, You have caused great distress within the lands of Uruk, and set great plagues upon her cattle, sheep, and goats. You have greatly damaged the city's milk, butter, and cheese economies. Even if I were to be lenient in ruling on the duel, it was established by the gods after the Great Flood that it is a capital offense to willingly damage Uruk's agricultural industries. Therefore I will not pardon your offense. And with that she slew him, and cast his corpse into the Euphrates. When Insugirana, the lord of Arata, heard that his sorcerer had failed, he meekly sent word to Enmer that he was ready to submit and pay tribute once again. Part 3. Lugalbanda in the Mountain Cave When in ancient days the heavens were separated from the earth, when the boundaries were laid out and the borders were fixed, when the cities were placed and inscribed with names, when the dikes and canals were purified and sanctified, when the wells were dug and the waters were opened up, when the city of Uruk first came to prominence, when the scepter and staff of Uruk were held high in the Queen Mother Inanna's holy game of agony, and when the office of emperor first passed down from the heavens to humanity, it was presented to Enmer the hunter, the living son of the god Utu, when Enmer's subordinate, the lord of Arata, made his rebellious intentions clear, Enmer set his mace towards the city of Arata and prepared a military expedition against it. 
He heralded his levies to prepare for mobilization, and his army took to the field like a great flood, marching out from each city to join Enmer's host as he passed northward. They created the largest force the world had yet seen, covering the ground like a heavy fog, and a dense dust was whirled up by them, reaching up to the sky. The Uruk army numbered a total of 25,200 men, including clubmen, spearmen, skirmishers, and archers. These troops were divided into eight war chiefs, each war chief being either a renowned Sumerian hero or a city overseer who was loyal to the emperor. Subordinate to each war chief were a number of captains who commanded between 300 and 600 men each. When the army had traveled about half the way to Arata and had come to the highlands north of Nineveh, they made camp and began ritually purifying themselves by bathing. During this time, one of the eight war chiefs, Lugalbanda by name, began suffering a strange illness. His limbs became weak and weary, and none of the army's physicians knew how to help him. After deliberating what to do, the emperor decided to leave Lugalbanda in a mountain cave, but not before having prepared for him a large amount of barley bread, butter, cheese, and alcohol, to sustain him until the siege had been completed. Dates and fig leaves they prepared for him also. They laid out incense for him and made sure his equipment was in proper order, in case he returned to health on his own accord. So Lugalbanda was left there in the mountain cave, weeping as Enmer's host continued along the river systems through the mountainous countries towards Arata, utilizing the very routes that Lugalbanda had painstakingly drawn up for them over his years of travel towards and from Arata. When they reached the end of the mountains and the city was no more than two hours distant, they made camp. Lugalbanda lay ill in the cave for two and a half days, and a cold darkness gradually fell upon him. During this time, he saw a vision of the god Utu, and he wept to the god as if to his own father. O oh god, let me be ill no longer. You have let me come up to the mountains in the company of my brothers. Let me complete my task and bring honor to my house, to my mother, and to my brothers. Do not let me die here like a weakling. Utu accepted his tears and sent down his divine encouragement to him within the mountain cave. The goddess Inanna, daughter of the god Nana, left her abode within the Ayana temple of Uruk and appeared before Lugalbanda in vision. Inanna, she whose pleasure it is to do battle, she who goes out to the tavern and brings delight to men, she who makes the bedchamber delightful, food for the loveless man. When Lugalbanda saw her, he wept to her as if to his own mother. O oh God, am I to die here and not in my own home, in my own city? Am I not to die in Uruk, the city in which my parents bore me? Oh, please let it not be so. May my limbs not perish in these cypress mountains. Inanna accepted his tears, and she filled his body with health, and enveloped his heart with joy, as if she were giving a woolen garment to a cold, shivering child, and thence returned to her abode within the Ayana temple of Uruk. Finally, the god Nana appeared before Lugalbanda. And he greeted the god as if to his own grandsire. O oh god, Nana, he in the heavens whom none can reach, he who enlightens the night sky with his brilliance, he who knows and loves justice, he who knows and hates evil, grant me the power to stand. Grant me the ability to complete my task and bring joy to your holy heart. Nana accepted his tears, conferring upon his feet the power to stand. Lugalbanda came out from the mountain cave and beheld the rolling hills and flowing rivers. He gathered plants for food, prepared and ate them, and drank the river water. Then he made a trap in which he caught two mountain goats and then skinned and dressed them. He prepared a fire to cook the meat by sparking flint stones and enjoyed a full meal. That evening, Lugalbanda gathered the remaining food and equipment which had been left for him by his comrades and after filling himself with beer, he fell into a deep sleep, the first night he would spend without pain in three days. And he slept soundly in the mountainous wasteland under the moonlight. When he slept, he dreamed a vision of the god Utu, the goddess Inanna, and the god Nana, who all bid him to slaughter a brown bull for them, and to burn its fat for them as an offering. So when Lugalbanda awoke, he took his axe, a beautiful tin weapon, and his iron dagger, 
and he set off to find the brown bull the gods had beckoned him to find in the mountains. As the sun rose, Lugalbanda found the bull. He slew it, skinned and dressed it, and offered up its fat to the gods, along with the fat of the mountain goats of the previous night, and also bread and alcohol from his own supplies. All these he burned, and the gods devoured them with pleasure. Lugalbanda observed the smoke of his offering as it was devoured by the gods, and another vision struck him. Utu showed him the destiny of the people of Arata, those miserable folk who are like gazelles running in flight, wild animals descending like a storm. They pile up wheat, barley, and flax that is destined for Inanna's chosen people, the Sumerians of Aruk. They work all day and lie in their beds at night, believing themselves to be a blessed people, and ever failing to please the Queen Mother Inanna. They nestle at her bosom when they're in dire need, and then go off on their own business, after she has lovingly returned their health or courage to them. The wise elders of the court of Arata shame those who are favored in the mind of Utu, who would speak up against their arrogant and presumptuous conduct. The high priests of Mount Ararat prepare for sacrifice those who are favored in Inanna's heart, who would stand up in battle against them. But with great losses, the men of Uruk shall prevail over the men of Arata. The soldiers of the emperor shall stand joyfully as they witness Inanna wear the holy crown under the clear sky. From their mouths a great roar will raise up, like that of wild boars in a reed thicket. They shall stand in the thick of battle, and with their spirit they shall prove themselves favored by her, and as Utu comes forth from his chamber, wielding his holy battle mace, then the men of Arata shall know their folly, and why they shall find death dealt to them by the humble servants of the gods. Part 4. Lugalbanda and the Anzu Bird Lugalbanda lie idle in the mountains, far away to the north, no mother or father to offer him advice. No one whom he knows, whom he values. No confidant comes to talk to him. But his heart spoke to him with the voice of the gods. Health and courage returned to his heart, and in gratitude he offered sacrifice to Utu, to Inanna, and to Nana. When all these things were done, he saw a vision of a great tree, the tree home of the Anzu birds, great multicolored predatory creatures with the heads and manes of lions. The tree stood atop a nearby tall mountain, and with its shade it covered the highest eminences of the adjacent mountains like a cloak. It spread out over them like a tunic. Lugalbanda made his way towards this mountain, and he could see no cypress growing upon it, nor any living thing save the tree and the Anzu birds. Now, the Anzu bird's behavior is in this wise. At daybreak, the bird stretches itself and cries out the morning cry, and its cry shakes the mountains, causing earthquakes and catastrophes. It has the teeth of a shark and an eagle's claws. Wild bulls run in terror from it into the foothills, and stags run away even deeper into the mountains. Lugalbanda climbed the tree and looked upon the nest of one of them nestled up high, he could see a young Anzu chick, but its mother was nowhere to be seen, since she had gone off to hunt. So he took barley bread from his pack along with fatty sheep's meat, and fed them to the Anzu chick until it was satisfied. When the Anzu bird mother returned from its hunting, she was carrying a large brown bull in her talons. And when she saw another in her nest besides her chick, she cried out a cry of woe. But upon seeing that Lugalbanda was kind and exultant, she relented and thanked him for what he had done. Now it was within the power of the Anzu bird to bestow gifts to mortal men who pleased them. And when Lugalbanda told the tale of all that had transpired, she spoke these words to him. We the Anzu birds are the overseers who decide the destiny of the rolling rivers. We keep the righteous on the straight and narrow path. The gods brought us here, and it was they who allowed us to bar the entrance of the mountains as if by a great door. Who shall alter the fates we fix? Who shall speak up against the words we speak? Since you are a man of honor and piety, I shall fortify you with the gift of speed, that speed which is possessed by the gods themselves. No opponents within these mountains will be able to overtake you, and you shall never grow fatigued. 
You shall fulfill your destiny, and thereby your name will be made famous in Sumeria. Thereupon Lugalbanda was roused from his vision. He took in his hand such of his provisions as he had not yet used or eaten, and his weapons one by one, and made his way towards the army of Enmer the hunter. The emperor had marched his troops close to Arata and had made their camp. Lugalbanda ran through the mountains, and the Anzu bird mother flew on high, looking down upon the emperor's army. When Lugalbanda reached the end of the mountains and approached the camp, she flew down towards him and gave him this advice. Do not tell your companions of me, or of the boon I gave you, for I do not wish for them to come into our home seeking boons of their own. And with that she departed back to her nest, and Lugalbanda walked into the emperor's camp. Lugalbanda stepped into the midst of the troops, and they chattered away amongst each other. Some came to him, wearying him with questions. And he told them that he had been blessed by the gods with health and with speed, and how he was able to step quickly towards where he now stood. But of the Anzu tree or its birds he said nothing. Then his companions embraced him and kissed him, treating him with respect, since the gods had shown favor upon him. The emperor, Enmer the hunter, son of Utu, was pleased with the return of his prized war chief hero, but his thoughts were on how he might take the city. The arrows, javelins, and sling stones of the enemy fell upon his troops like rain falling from Arata's walls. After the siege had gone on for about a year, Enmer summoned an assembly of his officers and sought a messenger whom he could send back to Uruk, and Lugalbanda gladly offered to go. Then Enmer began a speech before them. Once upon a time, the queen mother and Nana summoned me in her holy heart to become the king of brick-built Uruk. For fifty years I was a successful leader, overseeing the building of public works. After fifty years passed, the Martu people, who knew no agriculture, arose throughout all of Sumer and Akkad. But the wall of Uruk extended out across the desert like a great net, and caught them before they grew too authoritative. Yet now it seems that in these circumstances, my attractiveness to her has dwindled. My troops may be loyal, but it feels as if she has run off back to the Ayana temple in Uruk. Therefore, speak loudly to her upon your return, Lugalbanda, and if at last we may not take the city of Arata, ask her that we may at least be allowed to return home and not die in these foreign lands. Lugalbanda then gave heed to the words of his king, and the hearts of his brothers beat loudly as he began running to Uruk. He journeyed by day with Utu in the heavens, and by night under the light of Nana. He traveled across the mountains, and within a day he lifted his eyes as he approached Uruk, and marched joyously into the city, entering the courtyard of the city's lords. He made known the authority of his king, and entered the Ayana temple. He prostrated before Inanna and spoke the words that were put into his heart. My master, Enmer the hunter, the lord of Uruk, has sent me to you. And he has spoken thusly. And he repeated Enmer's words to her. Sajburu the witch was in attendance, and she spoke to Lugalbanda with the voice of holy Inanna herself. Near the city of Arata, on the banks of the clear river, the fish and frogs eat and make merry. The roots of tamarisk trees drink from the river. One tamarisk stands alone nearby, above a great pool, and Enmer must order it to be cut down. He must order the reed thickets of that place to be dug up and the water removed. Then he will have brought to an end that which the subterranean waters provide, the life strength of Arata. So Lugalbanda returned to Enmer with great speed and relayed Holy Inanna's message to the emperor. Enmer followed in on his word. The tamarisk was found and cut, and the reed thickets were removed. The water was drained, and as she had foretold, they brought an end to the life strength of Arata. His army carried off from the city its worked metal and stone. All of the men of the city who were not killed were resettled in other territories, and their homes were laid waste. Arata's battlements were stripped of their tin and stones. The treasury of the city was emptied and all that which could not be removed from its foundation was burned, until the whole city became bright red with flame. Praise be to Enmer the Hunter, and to Lugalbanda the Holy.